Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome to another episode of Sri's daily global COVID-19 show. My name is Sri Srinivasan, and it's my honor to convene this daily conversation around all things COVID-19. On this show, we talk about various crises, the healthcare crisis, the financial crisis, and the inequality crisis. On specific episodes, we tackle different industries and what's happening in different professions as well. Sometimes we meet folks who are working as doctors. Sometimes we meet people who are working in entertainment. And today we are going to be focused on the field of entertainment. Today is episode 172. We've been on the air for 172 straight days, every day of quarantine, every day of lockdown in New York, almost six straight months. Today, we're going to meet Mason Alexander Park, film and TV and stage actor who starred in the national tour of Hedwig and the Angry Inch. This winter, Park was a tour de force starring in the acclaimed production of I Am My Own Wife, a Pulitzer Prize winning play. They've also appeared in Nickelodeon's iCarly. They'll soon be shooting a new series overseas, so we're very excited to have them here with us. Also joining us is special guest Kevin Paley, assistant director of I Am My Own Wife at the Long Wharf Theater. They are a non-binary artist who founded The Art Garage, one of the few trans-led theater companies in New York City. And one of our producers is our co-host today, Rose Horowitz, at Rose Horowitz 31, journalist, founder of hashtag women to follow and co-producer of this show. You'll meet all of them in just a few minutes. Please tag and share with your family and friends right now. Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody. I'm Sri. So great to see you all here. Thank you for being here. We have been on the air almost six straight months, and that's because of all of you. Many thanks to every person who's written in to say this show is, uh, is uplifting. This show is a lifeline. And I want to tell you, this show is a lifeline for me. It is uh, uplifting for me. Thank you so much. We're live right now on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube, and on LinkedIn. I'm the Marshall Loeb Visiting Professor of Digital Innovation at Stony Brook School of Journalism and co-founder of DigiMentors, a social, digital, and virtual events consulting company. Our motto, don't cancel your physical event without talking to us. Don't plan your virtual event without getting in touch. My email address is right here. Please write in and please tell us how we can help you. If you're joining us for the first time or you haven't been here in a while, this is what the show is about. On the first 165 episodes, we had a million plus viewers, 120 million plus social impressions, more, all, more than 300 guests 62 city, from 62 cities, 16 countries, including the chief scientist of the World Health Organization. We've had doctors, nurses, authors, journalists, CEOs, founders, teachers, professors, actors, and so much more. We're in partnership with Scroll Global and Scroll.in. Please check them out. Our archives are on youtube.com slash Srinet. All 172 episodes can be found there. Big thanks to our producers, Rose Horowitz, at Rose Horowitz 31. You'll meet her in a little bit. And Vandana Menon, Vandana underscore Menon. Please follow both of them on Twitter. We're always grateful to our sponsors. So let's say thanks to Muckrack Academy and their Fundamentals of Social Media course. It's a course that they helped me put together. It's free and you get a certificate. mrac.co slash social, mrac.co slash social. More than 4,000 people have taken that course and so should you. I learned a lot putting that together. You will learn a lot too. Please check it out. Big thanks to Nunbelievable divinely delicious cookies on a mission. Each handcrafted cookie provides one meal to those in need. One cookie equals one meal. 20% off with the code SRE, S-R-E-E. Check out nunbelievable.com. We also are grateful for promotional consideration from The Inventor in You, a step-by-step -step guide to your first invention by Charles Cunnan Carroll, developer of more than 80 patents at Inventor Charles and guide to invention.com is his website. We are also grateful for the promotional consideration from
The new Indian film Sadak 2 has just premiered today and is now streaming straight to your screen only on Hotstar with subtitles, hotstar.com slash US, hotstar.com slash US. And we also want to thank our event partner, Rise or Fall Together, the OneShare.World Interdependence Summit 2020, Thursday, September 17th. Fabulous speakers, as you can see on your screen. Register now, a free global conference, OneShare.World. And the DigiMentors team is proud to partner and help put this together. Please check it out. And a final thank you to our friends at She's On Call. Dr. Sujana Chandrasekhar and Dr. Marina Korean host this daily program, sorry, this weekly program, Sundays at 11 a.m. Eastern. You can find it on Facebook at She's On Call and on Twitter and YouTube, She's On Call. They always have great guests to be with us and to talk and share information about COVID and so much more. All right, let's now bring on our guests to talk about what is happening in the world of entertainment and to meet Mason Alexander Park, film and TV and stage actor who starred in a national tour of Hedwig and the Angry Inch. First, let me say hello to Rose Horowitz and then we'll bring Mason and then assistant director of I Am My Own Wife, Kevin Paley. Let me first say hi to Rose. Hi, Rose. Hi, how are you, Sri? Great to see you. Great. We've been working together every single day for 172 days. Amazing partnership, you, me, and Vandana. Mm -hmm. I don't think you and Vandana have met in person yet. No, we hope to, because she's now in New York vicinity, but she's always on the move. So I hope we will. <laughs> we, we have to arrange that. Uh, tell us how you met Mason and how you pulled this together. Okay. Uh, this winter, I have a friend who's involved in a, um, a, a, called play, a, a theater group called Play With Your Own Food, and they do uh, productions all around um, Connecticut and Fairfield County. Uh, and a friend said to me, you have to see this show. You have to see this show. So Diana Muller told me that, and I uh, got tickets with my daughter to see, uh, to see I Am Your Own Wife. I Am My Own Wife at the Long Wharf Theater. And uh, I was just mesmerized by the performance that uh, Mason gave and the whole staging and lighting uh, costumes of the shows. It was just tremendous and such a fascinating story. Uh, and uh, afterwards there was a talk back uh, with uh, Mason and I, I did that with, with uh, and, and it was just great to hear his, him talking about the play and how he tried to, how, what he aimed to do in the role and, uh, how this play was different from the version uh, that was, I mean, the, 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 the play when it was on Broadway, I think in 2004, if I'm right, so. And that's how, and so we decided that we will meet Mason and talk to them about their work. And we were also bring, able to bring in the assistant director on the play as well. But let's talk to Mason first, let's bring him on. Uh, here is Mason Alexander Park. Hi, Mason. Hi. Hi, everybody. Hi. <laughs> Thank nice you so much you. for joining us. It, uh, it was, uh, I kept trying to, to connect with you uh, on Twitter and we finally, we finally did. And you were uh, very happy to, yeah. very happy you could be on the show. You're on the show. Yeah, Twitter is, uh, Twitter is always challenging for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting better at it though. Okay. <laughs> but we, we, want, we want everybody to follow you on Twitter, uh, Mason A. Park, so they can uh, find you. Mason, my first question is always, how are you? How's your family doing through the crisis? <laughs> Uh, we're do, we're doing okay. I mean, a lot better than you know it could be for me. I left New York City a little bit ago, um, and I've spent most of my time in quarantine with my parents who live in Virginia. So uh, it felt like a really nice chance for me to un and reconnect with my family and uh, work on other creative uh, avenues that are beyond just being on stage or or being in front of a camera. So it's been a, a, a wonderfully recharging and fulfilling moment in the times when things are not, you know, completely overwhelmingly uh, disastrous, which also, you know, it comes in waves. Um, but overall, we're doing we're doing rather well. So I can't complain. Well, that's that's great to great to hear. And I just want have to go into a close up again because this lighting is fantastic. This is how we know you're a star because you've got great lighting. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's how it jobs. I have to I have to have this kind of stuff in order to compete nowadays. Everyone's <laughs> booking things on Zoom. <laughs> uh, tell us about it looks like you have a your we can see the lights of a vanity it looks like in your glasses yeah yeah i um <laughs> i did a, a really wonderful event for iheart radio they did this enormous um pride uh digital pride event in june and they asked a bunch of the uh, uh the, the head bigs from the Broadway production and John Cameron Mitchell, who wrote it and originally starred in, in the film and the off-Broadway show, uh, to come and, and sort of reunite and do this kind of virtual wig in a box performance. So uh, it was me and Neil Patrick Harris and Andrew Rannells and Darren Chris and a bunch of amazing people just uh, sent in videos of us like with a bunch of props and costumes that iHeartRadio had sent us. And this was one of the things uh, this beautiful vanity was one of the things that I got to keep from it. And I was like, oh my God, this is, could not have helped me out more right now. <laughs> it fits right behind my computer and I can just, I can just turn it on and not worry about anything. That, 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 that's awesome to hear. For people who, uh, we, we have an international audience, you're gonna meet them in just a couple of minutes. Uh, what, tell them about uh, kind of the landmark importance of Hedwig and the Angry Inch. It's not a play that everyone may know, especially now. So please give us that mm -hmm. background. And give them that kind of histor uh, historical relevance of the of the plays of the of the play too. Uh, yeah, Hedvig to me was um, always one of those shows that I had kind of known a little bit about as uh, just coming from the queer world. Um, I had I had heard whisperings about it, and it's like a, it's a bit of a cult hit. Um, the film is at least, um, and uh, the show is. I, I think it is one of the only, if not the best, um, example of what a non-binary character looks like. And he, so it's sort of held up really well over the last couple of years. It is a amazing uh, concert experience, basically. You're watching uh, a transgender rock star from Germany kind of give this part cabaret confessional, part like David Bowie um, rock concert all wrapped into one. And uh, it's it's just a beautiful story about the love that we seek in other people and the love that we uh, seek in ourselves and that self-acceptance. And so I think that it's, it's found a beautiful, lovely, uh, wide audience, especially, um, and it has found uh, a really amazing international audience. I believe Korea, it's been running there for on and off for the last like 30 years. And so John Cameron Mitchell, who wrote it and originally starred in it, said that he's never felt more famous in his life than the time, any time that he goes over, over the concert or something, that it's it's like the equivalent of seeing Selena Gomez or somebody like on the street, that everybody just knows who he is and chases after him. Um, because Hedvig is, is this amazing universal story that I think everyone can connect with and understand um, and so it's been translated into so many amazing languages and the music is just so stunning uh, that it is definitely, there are a few shows that I think um, are capable of doing that. And, uh, and it's uh, what better of a show to be able to sort of cross all those boundaries than, than one about, you know, someone who is uh, on paper, not necessarily the most easily understood person to, in terms of normal conventions and whatever heteronormal society might see someone like Hedvig uh, being. So it's exciting. It's a cool show. And is it, uh, it seems to me, a very difficult performance because they, it requires a lot of you. <laughs> Yeah, it is a it is a tour de force. Um, it's basically a one person show. There's a band, and the Hedvig has a husband uh, who sings back up in the band. But over the course of the entire evening, I don't think anyone else on stage speaks more than two to three words. Uh, it really is her story and her show um, in terms of the demands of that specific actor. So it's. Uh, an incredibly physically demanding show, a vocally demanding show, and a really emotionally demanding show. Um, I was tired like crazy every single night. I was very, very drained after doing it. And I think all of us, all the actors who have sort of been through the ringer of it, there is this sisterhood, a camaraderie, like uh, any time I run into any of them uh, in New York City, there is this understanding that like we have been to 
to the top of the mountain in terms of um, theatrical experiences as an actor. Uh, it is, as I, I believe it was Meryl Streep that called it Hamlet on uh, heels. I like that. <laughs> Hamlet. Yeah. Hamlet on the, heels. Is, Hamlet on heels, yeah. Hamlet is hard enough to do, and then you add the heels, that makes it harder. Let's yeah. uh, take a look at uh, what we call our global tour. We're just, and then we're going to bring in uh, our our friend Kevin to say hello as well. Kevin Paley, who directed you in this other play that we're talking about as well. Uh, let's see who's watching from around the world. We'll start in Pennsylvania. Uh, Tim Sohn is up late in Pennsylvania with the bears and the turkeys. I just saw a bear <laughs> yesterday. Uh, Mark Lee and Tim was the very first sponsor on the show. We're always grateful. Uh, for that, uh, supporting uh, this kind of work is uh, not easy, and so we're glad to have it, uh, have him support us. Mark says, good morning from uh, Durham, good evening from Durham, North Carolina. No bears there, but I'm sure the rabbits, squirrels, and deers are still are here. Tim does a shout out to the amazing Rose Horowitz and the relentless Sri Srinivasan. Charles Cunnan-Carroll is watching from North Caldwell, New Jersey. Hi, Charles, thank you for sponsoring and supporting us. Rahajan is watching from Long Island, Hi, Rajan. Thank you for being here. And uh, Doug Levy says, it's great to have the show to count on. Thank you. And he's watching from San Francisco. Uh, give us a favorite memory of San Francisco, Mason. Uh, I we San Francisco was actually our first stop on tour when I toured with Hedvig and Angry Inch. So at the time, Darren Chris was playing the role and, and people watching this would know Darren from Glee or the assassination of Gianni Versace, um, a very accomplished film and television actor and, and stage actor as well. Um, and Darren, uh, that's Darren's hometown. And so Darren was playing the part um, and I was his standby. And I, I, I had such a wonderful time. My apartment was in the Castro district, which is like one of the gayest places on earth. And it was just, it was a really lovely place to kind of like walk to, you know, walk through like on my way to work every day just to see like rainbow flags everywhere and, and, uh, and rainbow crosswalks on the street. It was, it was, uh, cute and, and comforting and in a way that I didn't, I didn't expect the city to be so quaint um, and uh, and yet bustling at the same time. Um, so I we had a lot of really great uh, San Francisco mo nights out and late nights at diners while we were there. Nice. Uh, Jonathan's yeah. watching from the East Village. Give us an East Village memory. Oh God. Uh, if anyone knows, Alan Cumming has a bar in the East Village um, called club coming and i've spent many uh, a very weird night there <laughs> including a new year's eve party that was uh, a, a sight to behold i think i want to hear all about that maybe another time we'll talk just about the new year's eve party <laughs> what's the name of that bar uh club coming club it was Com something that alan he had started while he was uh doing cabaret on broadway there was uh he had a dressing room that um that he like stocked with liquor. Uh, it was, I believe it was sponsored by multiple companies and uh, and he used to throw miniature parties after the show because it's a very dark show. Like Cabaret is a very heavy show. And I think it was a part of his process in terms of unwinding. So they had built this beautiful neon sign that had said club coming and they used to call uh, that his dressing room that. And then uh, I think it was a year or two afterwards. He was like, I'm just going to buy a bar in East <laughs> Village. I'm going to make club coming an accessible thing for everybody. <laughs> So he, uh, he's been doing that for many years. It's very cool. <laughs> very nice to hear. And Jonathan's watched 172 episodes in a row. So we're very grateful uh, to him. And Mark is giving a shout out to Rose, uh, the, the ama truly amazing Rose. And um, Kathleen's watching from California. And let's see, so many other folks are joining. Apollo's watching from Vegas. Uh, and then we'll take a break on the uh, comments. Uh, do you have a Vegas story you're allowed to tell on a global television? <laughs> Um, I, I, I had an old partner who used to, uh, live in Vegas. So I spent a lot of time, um, our family lived in Henderson, which is a short drive in. So I have a lot of very, most of my Vegas stories are very PG because it's different when you live, uh, like in a neighboring area, you have such a different experience with it. I feel like I only went into Vegas once or twice with them and it was like to grab dinner. Um, we, I, I definitely do not have like a lot of nuts of stories about Vegas. Unfortunately, uh, I can't tell you how disappointed I am, but thank you. Uh, 
<laughs> we'll expect you to make up for that in the rest of the evening with some great yeah. stories. And uh, before I, we bring on Kevin, uh, uh, I know that Rose has a couple of questions, but I have a question for you. We are mourning today the great Chadwick Boseman. I'd love for you to reflect on what you thought of him and his passing at such an incredibly young age. It's always difficult when someone passes when when like we perceive as uh, a young age or too soon um, because you I don't know there isn't like time to sort of assess the amount that that a person has done in their life and be like oh well they did everything that they possibly could have and you know they lived a full life which Chadwick did but because he was 43 years old it like it, it's such a an insane tragedy to think of how much more he um, had left in him, to think of how many things that he accomplished artistically and emotionally while he was going through what he was going through you know, for those last four years um, is such a testament to his character, uh, to his uh, ability to really put everything into his work because like there, I know people that don't show up to work when they have a cold, let alone, you know, doing something that's physically demanding as, as acting and especially in the kinds of movies that he was doing at the time. Um, I, it's, it's really unfathomable and I, and I'm so, so very sad that we lost an incredible artist, but also like a really wonderful, um, person just in general, you know, he was always so unbelievably kind in all his interviews and the people that I know that have worked with him um, have had nothing but amazing things to say about about his professionalism and his kindness. And it's, it's, it stinks when you lose people that are just genuinely really amazing people. I mean, it's hard to lose anyone, but um, knowing the effect that he had to on gener now future generations of, of children of color and people that are gonna be able to watch his movies and and see themselves reflected on screen. He did leave behind an, an incredible legacy that I think his entire family and, and him would be unbelievably proud. So and we, yeah, yeah and we, that, those are my like immediate thoughts. No, thank you. And I know I put you on the spot, but thank you for that. Last night we were live on the air when the tweet went out from the family on the Chadwick Boseman Twitter handle. And that tweet has in less than 24 hours become yeah. the most liked tweet in history and uh, just tells you about all the people he touched and how uh, important yeah. he was in the uh, uh, in, in the entertainment world. Uh, so Rose, I'm gonna let you ask uh, him a couple of questions and then we've got to bring in Kevin Paley who directed, um, uh, who directed uh, Mason in, uh, the, in, in the play that you were describing earlier. So uh, Mason, you're gonna get uh, grilled by Rose, get ready. She's a tough, tough cookie and uh, then we'll bring in Kevin, okay? Thank you very much. Go ahead, Rose. Hi, Mason. <clears throat> Thanks again for joining us. I'm very excited to have you. Uh, tell me how you prepared yourself, or can you tell us a little, people who don't know about the play, I Am My, my Own Wife, and how you prepared yeah. yourself for that role? So I Am My Own Wife is a one-person show, uh, similar to kind of how Hedvig functions. Um, except for it's a play, and uh, it is about a real-life trans woman from Germany uh, named Charlotte Malstorff, who was a bit of a hotly debated and contested uh, personality at the time. She survived the Nazis. She survived the Stasi. She ran a museum um, in which she collected everyday furniture and artifacts and sort of... Um, loved the normalcy of uh, and the history of everyday objects and and in the basement of that museum she also ran a, a cafe or a, or a gay club and took in a lot of queer people and uh really was a very prominent figure especially as an out trans woman she was uh an openly person um in in germany at the time she is sort of an enigma it's a it's a kind of story and a kind of character that, you know, we do not hear of or hear from often because she is an actual historical figure whose life was not necessarily, her life was marred with tragedy. It was a very difficult and challenging um, life that she led, but the play really highlights the optimism and the love that she had. And it's kind of astounding to think that there really are people that, um, 
are shaped by the things that happen to them and are shaped by the choices that they have to make and come out the other side a much stronger and well-adjusted and content person. Um, and I think historically, we just see queer stories as generally being very um, dramatic and very depressing and very they're bordering on trauma porn. You know, a lot of it is about the, the sadness and the um, and the the drama that surrounds uh, those difficult times in a queer person's life, and this show had a, a beautiful balance of being able to do that um, and emotionally, you know, uh, give you an insight into what she kind of went through as a trans woman at her time. But it also showed that that it just made her stronger and it made her an even more vibrant and amazing woman. Um, and so that's, uh, in a nutshell, kind of what the show means uh, to me or, or, or how I can kind of like compartmentalize it into a very small, uh, uh, quick sentences of what, it, of what it's about. But that's, yeah, that's kind of what I Am My Own Wife is, uh, is a little bit about. How many characters did you play? Because you, you just kept transforming yourself. Uh, I believe, I think the tally is 42. Um, I, I, I'll have to double language? check on that. I think. How many languages did you use in that show? Didn't you? Uh, four. Okay. Three or four. Um, I think it was only, yeah, I think it was only French, German. Actually, it might have just been three. It might have been French, German, and, and English. Um, I was very, yeah, I was very lucky to not have to juggle too many languages. It was all stuff that I generally had experienced before or, you know, I have had a, a really long string of German roles from doing Cabaret and Hedwig and Dio and Wife kind of back to back to back. So uh, I've sort of been immersed in the culture of, of Berlin. And, um, and that definitely helped me with this specific uh, character in, in, a, in a great way. Because then I was able just to focus on, you know, the lines and and figuring out who each individual person was, as opposed to being like, I cannot even begin to wrap my head around this accent or these, you know, these words, because um, it's a very, it is a very challenging accent, I think, to nail down. <laughs> it is. Uh, how did you, one of the things that came up in the talk back was how you played this role differently from how it was played uh, when, it, when it ran on Broadway and uh, the reviews were glowing and, and called you like, you know, so light and graceful uh, and sort of bringing mm -hmm. a, a new a, a lightness to this role, which, you know, I mean, the, the story is fraught with a lot of tragic things. As well. Yeah, uh, I, I think that being queer and being, you know, a non-binary, a transgender person um, already helps so much because I am not an actor that's stepping into a world that I don't directly understand. I am someone that understands the nuances of gender because of my experience with the world and my experience growing up trying to figure out, you know, who I was in a way that, you know, a gender actor doesn't necessarily have that experience and kind of has to do their homework and sit down and have meetings with transgender people to try to like talk through those things. You know, it's, it's kind of the classic trope that we see um, anytime a, a male actor wins an Oscar for playing a trans woman. It's kind of this, oh, it's all transformation. It's all about the, how amazing that, you know, he lost 10 pounds to do this and looks great in a dress and like, oh, he talked to trans people, women and like practiced in heels. Those are all things that are completely um, physical and and uh and are not necessarily uh indicative of the um, um, amazing work of an actor so much as like of a researcher you know of, of someone who's like training for a marathon or, or or something which has a lot to do with acting and every role you know has that kind of a process but for me when it comes to parts like this and i think why everyone is like has such a reaction whenever they see me play a character that was originally written for someone of a trans space, whether it be a non-binary role or, or, or otherwise. Um, people are always just like, they experience it so differently because they can tell that one, it's not pretense, and two, um, that there is a deeper understanding and reflection of the humanity of the person within it, and that I'm, I'm, I don't have to sit 
character and try to play a certain thing. I don't have to show you what a, what a woman looks like or what my idea of a trans woman looks like, because I know what my idea of gender is and I know what my experience of gender is. So I can use that in a way that um, someone who doesn't have that kind of, uh, of a history with their own gender journey um, can't really access those things. Um, and they have to pretend. And that's great because that is so much of what acting is. But uh, representation is so much more important at the end of the day. And it's so much easier to sit and watch a story being told by someone who uh, has that experience and is uh, of that world than it is watching someone doing working really hard to make it look like that is, you know, uh, effortless and that's there every day because people can see right through it. Um, uh, and, and I'm so happy that the world's kind of waking up to this idea that cisgender people should not be playing trans roles because there are so few opportunities for us anyway to begin with. Um, and then, you know, the second that there's a role that's written for someone who's trans, it tends to go to someone who isn't and is looking for a challenge. Uh, and I, I got to embrace the challenges of the actual character, the challenges of the actual text and of the show and of all the people. And so I, I got to spend so much more time making it real for the audience as opposed to figuring out, um, well, how would a trans woman experience this? Or, you know, how would I walk in these shoes? Um, it, because it's, it's, it's not necessarily the most important aspect of, of someone's um, of, of who someone is, you know, it never has been, but for, we fixate on the physicality of trans people because it seems to be the only way that cisgender people can understand a trans person and understand a trans journey. It's this idea of physicality, of what's going on with the body, what's going on with the voice, why do they wear that, all that kind of stuff. Um, and this was a chance for us just to throw it all away and get into a room full of, of trans people actors and and artists and creatives and just sort of say well what is the actual story and how do we service that what what can you say about the way popular culture is embracing this idea of having actual trans people play the roles of trans people we're in such a really interesting uh like moment in, in woke culture where i think people are really coming around to um, to battle and to, to fight these systems of oppression that kind of exist in all industries. Um, and there are a lot of oppressive systems that exist in the entertainment industry. And uh, it, it has historically kept people that are of, you know, the, the queer experience and of the trans experience specifically from having access to work and having access to training and having access to uh, representation and all these kinds of things. Um, and we're in a moment where we're finally moving away from the fetish fetishization. I think like a couple years ago, there were so many actors that were playing, uh, so many like straight white cis men that were playing trans roles and queer roles and sort of parading around in these guises for awards. Um, and the world kind of went nuts for it and, and thought they were so brave and thought they were so amazing. And now we're finally in a place where I think the world realizes that there are actually actors out there that are capable of those, playing those roles and, and having those experiences um, and doing more than that, too. You know, trans people should be able to play roles that aren't just trans in the same way that cis people can play whatever they want. Um, and so we're like in a good place where I think people are trying to push push the line forward a little bit and and support marginalized voices, support queer people, support people of color and trans people of color by giving them the opportunity to tell their own stories. Um, but it's a slow burn, you know, it takes a long time. We've been around since the beginning of time. We've been in the arts since the beginning of time. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's nice to be a part of uh, a, a moment in history where I see the work being done, even if it's slow and even if it's, only a few of us breaking through at a time. I, I'm lucky to have a career in, in all mediums in which I've been able to play, you know, myself now, you know, I've been able to see myself reflected on screen in a way that I never did when I was growing up. Um, you know, I never saw anyone that looked like me or talked like me or, or, or acted like me. And, uh, and it was hard because that's so, so much of 
how we decide as a society what's normal um, and what's acceptable. We look to art and we look to TV, we look to film, we look to books, and we kind of um, create a world based on th these things that we see and the normalcy of how they're treated in art. Um, so I, I think that we're finally breaking through somewhere, which is it, it's a lot of great progress has been made um, recently. Thank you. So many great comments coming in, and we're about to bring Kevin on. Rajan says, Long Wharf Theater, he's putting on the link to the play so people can mm -hmm. catch that. Stefan says, uh, here from Ramsey, New Jersey. I live right next door to the Jane Street wow. Hotel where Hedwig premiered in New York City. Loved it. Hi, Mason. You Yay. have what an incredible smile. Made me feel better instantly. <laughs> Tweeting from Spinet Social tonight. And uh, Stefan's oh. an awesome part of our Digimenters team. And you've got uh, people have linked here to Club Coming and Coming uh, NYC.com. And Rajan agreed. Mason has an incredible, infectious <laughs> smile. And uh, people are, are, are tagging others. And Rajan has also linked in to Kevin. So let's bring Kevin on. And Kevin can join us. Let's bring uh, Kevin on. Kevin Ooh. is uh, backstage and waiting, waiting very patiently. Assistant Director of <laughs> I Am My Own Wife at the Long Wharf. They are a non-binary artist who founded the Art Garage, one of the few trans-led theater companies in New York City. So everyone, please welcome Kevin Paley, who is here right now. Hi, Kevin. Hello. How are you? Thank you for having me. Thank you for being <laughs> here. I know you were waiting very patiently uh, backstage. Uh, I, you probably haven't listened to uh, Mason at such an extended length of time since the play. <laughs> so, <laughs> so give us an assessment of his performance so far, director. Oh, Mason is brilliant. I, I do love listening to Mason. Mason and I could talk about these topics for hours. Um, I, even like listening now, I'm like, oh, that's a good point. I'm gonna bring that up tomorrow. Um, we love these things. I also wanna say Mason has a beautiful smile. Um, I'm in the middle of dental surgery, so here's mine. Um, and uh, yeah, so Mason as an actor and as a human is brilliant on stage and off stage. That's what made the conversations um, in the rehearsal room so enriching is that Rebecca Martinez, the director, myself, Mason, the entire team, it was play because we were working on a show, but it was it was enriching in every every experience in life. We all grew as people as we were growing as artists. It was one of those perfect experiences. That's so great to hear. Uh, I didn't ask you my first question to all of our guests. How are you? How's your family doing? Where are you calling us tonight from? Oh, so that's a great question. I'm calling you from my mother's house in Connecticut. Um, and we, my mother and I have been quarantined together for six months when I left New York City in March. I'm moving back tomorrow morning. Um, so this was sort of, uh, we spent the day doing some things that we love together. Um, and then I'm gonna move back tomorrow and we're doing good. And you're still friends. Honestly, I was nervous, you know, I'm 26, I'm coming home, I'm gonna live with my mom. It went so much better than I expected. And I feel like I'm going back to New York with such a deeper appreciation for her. Um, and it's just gonna make coming home even more exciting in the future. All right, I'm gonna leave our, our friend Rose to uh, talk to both of you. I know she has some questions uh, for you as well. Folks, you're watching a conversation with Mason Alexander Park and Kevin Pelly. We are talking about acting, uh, now about directing and about the world of entertainment and what it's like to uh, uh, to perform and be in the entertainment business during COVID and so much more. We've touched on so many fascinating topics. We'd love to hear from you and ask some questions. We have about 20 minutes left with these folks. So over to you, Rose. Okay. <clears throat> Hi, Kevin. Uh, I don't think we, I think I must've met you at that um, talk back, but maybe we didn't meet uh, in person, you know, meet, greet each other. Can you tell me how you got started um, with uh, Long Wharf doing this show, doing I Am My Own Wife? Sure, so an assistant director's contract usually ends opening night. So I'm, I, I don't think we would have met at one of the talkbacks at one of the shows. Um, but the way that I got involved with the Long Wharf is that 
through my company, The Art Garage um, in New York City. We were with the Alliance of Resident Theaters and uh, someone who worked with the Alliance of Resident Theaters uh, then became the artistic producer of The Long Wharf. And when this opportunity came up, we chatted and she so graciously offered me the role of assistant director on this project. I very quickly met Rebecca, the director, who was already um, in rehearsal for another show coming straight into this one. Um, so we got to preparing. I'm from Connecticut, so I was excited to finally work at a regional theater that I grew up attending. Um, and then first day I met everyone and that was it. That's great. And what have you been doing in terms of, or what have you been pursuing in terms of your art since the pandemic started? Have you been able to do anything? Uh, the question of my art has really uh, blossomed this quarantine and expanded. Um, it's been clarified a little bit for me. At the beginning of quarantine, I was pursuing a career uh, primarily as a director and an artistic director. Um, and I had the acting bug that I grew up with itching in me. And in COVID, I began writing again projects for myself. Um, I began other artistic avenues. I built a patio for my mother. I took up makeup and sewing. So now I'm making my own clothing. Um, a little bit. We got some circle skirts. Um, <laughs> and my art has taken a turn for the pleasure a bowl in the sense that I enjoy it and with no expectation of selling it or marketing it right now, I'm finding that my brain is thriving and that I'm loving what I'm doing as when I first began it. Um, so I hope to have some music videos coming out soon, uh, some drag in the future, and I just found new representation as an actor. So I'm hitting the game uh, starting next month. That's awesome. Thank you. Uh, that's great to hear. It uh, sounds like a, a great uh, period for you. So that's terrific. Uh, and and tell me about you know your some some of the your impressions of when you did see Mason on stage. You know, did he change each day? Was it he doing the role anew that you saw different aspects? Mason is such a fascinating actor to work with. Um, I think. Uh, coming from actually without any qualifiers, like someone who can come in and immediately bring their heart and their vulnerability and their skill set, their training to a role on day one, a table read where someone else might have dipped their toe in the water. Mason dove in and knew that there was a team there to throw a lifeline if need be. And it's so refreshing to see an actor who's willing to throw themselves into the work at all cost with like completely healthy technique and parameter and an acting approach that, you know, they can come off stage and we can hypothesize about what the playwright Doug Wright was going for, what our production is going for. And then seeing that change, seeing the thought take seed and manifest in the voice, in the body, in the mind, it, it's really, um, it's a skill that people really need to refine to have the conceptualized notion manifest in their performance. And I think with Mason, the learning was never done because the audience is such a big conversation partner in a solo show and each audience was different. Mason had some interaction with the audience and was always learning. So personally, during all the previews, it was fascinating to watch um, like the show take on different timbre in different moments there was a new favorite moment every night to find that whether mason it was their favorite moment that night like i learned something new each night there was a new line that i heard differently and that's something that really keeps the art form of theater alive that's, that's great to hear that's great to hear i i should have gone twice and then i would have <laughs> <laughs> um how did you each, you know, can you tell me about your growing up? And I mean, Mason, you you talked a little bit about that, but how did you find who, who you were, if I can ask that? Um, uh, sure, Mason, yeah. do you? <laughs> I, uh, uh, okay, I'll, I'll make it super, super quick and happy. Um, basically, I, I moved around a lot because my dad worked for the government. So I think I was already um, at a very young age used to 
uh, change being a consistency in a weird way uh, and never having a central place to kind of rely on. So a lot of my personality and all of those things, I, I had to figure out a lot quicker than I think I had to grow up a lot faster than a lot of people. Um, just because I, I never was given the luxury of time uh, in one place. And so when I eventually found art and and began to act, I think that was a massive uh, release for me in terms of, you know, all the, all the tension and the questions that I had within myself about who I am and about my humanity and all of these kinds of things kind of manifested in, oh, I, I would love to, I would love being an artist and I like the transformational aspect of, of world building and character building. Um, and I think a lot of queer people kind of run to things like that because of, of the lack of, of consistency or understanding when you're at a young age, um, because the exact same tools that everybody else is given. You know, at the end of the day, I've been, I grew up and was born into a world that was very binary um, in terms of my day to day. So I was never really given a, an option to better understand who I was until I got much older um, because you're constantly sort of being shoved into different boxes. And that's so much of like what childhood is, is it should be an exploration of things. But I think that that society and parents and, uh, you know, uh, capitalism and all these things have kind of built these very specific, uh, you either wear blue or you wear pink or you're either gay or you're straight. And there's like, you have to make choices about your identity and not enough people question it growing up. So uh, I continued to challenge myself, continued to challenge and question who I was. Um, and, you know, I'm still discovering those kinds of things. I'm still figuring out who I am, but I've only been an out uh, non-binary for maybe the last two and a half to three years, um, you know, much of because I didn't have anyone to look up to to really understand that part of me and 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 know that the feelings that I had felt my whole life that that was uh, the word I could use to claim um, to help define you know who I was. I was kind of pushing all of those things away because that word didn't really exist. Um, so I was like this enigma that you know I didn't even understand. And now I, I know so much more about myself. Um, so that's kind of like my journey in a, in a very quick nutshell in terms of growing up and, and how that kind of related to, you know, who the, the monster that I have become. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. And I feel like we share a lot of things, except I was planted, instead of moving around, I was planted in uh, little old Portland, Connecticut, which has 9,000 people. Um, and even though we're in the New England social bubble, it's not the most progressive. Um, and I come from a truck driving family. So uh, you could say that at a young age, I was a self -pro self professed Tom girl. Um, and I was very happy uh, sort of living between the lines. And then as soon as I became a conscious individual at around seven, I realized that that was wrong, essentially, essentially. And I, um, I grew up perfecting my masculinity. You could say like, if you have femininity and masculinity here in their trees, I grew up forcing myself to grow towards the masculine tree, realizing that I was never gonna grow to my full potential. My roots were dying. And so I finally, when I was like 23, 24, um, was in actually like a contract. It was a summer stock contract I wasn't enjoying. And I really had to figure out like who I am and why I'm here. Uh, and that came with my identity. And I gave up on the, the weight of masculinity. And with every single shackle that I took off, I began to fly and I really have never looked back at the ground. Uh, it started with piercing my ears as like one little thing I always wanted to do for me. Then it became the makeup, then became the dresses. And then very quickly I realized that gender was only on the surface um, uh, periodically and that I really had to do the work on the inside to learn uh, what suited me and like what items from each gender that we consider like suits me. And I just found that when we celebrate everyone's essence, uh, sort of the details start to like fall away and we can see and celebrate each person for 
exactly what they are, their energy, their beauty. Um, and right now I'm non-binary because I don't, uh, I don't believe in the binary system. I'm trans feminine um, because I've always um, felt like a feminine spirit, but I'm in a six foot tall, rather stocky body. Uh, my voice is deep, my body is hairy. And I am moving through the world conscious of these things. And I love that humans are also starting to become conscious and not maintain the same judgments that come along with those qualities. And I'm excited for the future for even more of that. Well, thank you. You both uh, with a tremendous answer uh, in a very big question. You, you both uh, <laughs> told uh, dramatically and, and uh, delightfully. Uh, I guess, um, how do you see, the, like in the next five, 10 years, this, the world of, of uh, queer and what will happen in terms of entertainment? And, you know, I think one of the big shows, I mean, that I know that I watched and was a pose. And I think that was the first mm -hmm. time that they had, you know, you had trans people playing trans people and it was a huge, you know, success. And how how has that been? A, you know, something that has sort of burst this this uh, idea that that it's so you know that 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 uh, of, of more parts for trans people and more representation in media. Uh, I think that we, I mean, as a community, we've always understood the power that representation has, um, but we just haven't necessarily been given the tools or the platforms. And now you're seeing uh, you know, trans characters pop up on a lot of shows that you know a couple of years ago would not have existed. You have you know, a non-binary character on Billion. You have you know non-binary characters that are popping up in like Sabrina the Teenage Witch, and 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 it's kind of spectacular to see that, especially with younger generations and shows that are aimed at younger audiences, um, this inclusion of of those characters and of actors of that world. Um, Pose is an amazing example. It is such a, a beautiful um, visual and emotional experience uh, that is centered around Black trans women and Black trans voices, um, which are, uh, I mean, like I never in my lifetime would I have thought that a show about ballroom culture would become the hit that it has become, um, even though like I know it's something that I at my core would, you know, die to watch. Like, it's amazing to see moments uh, that we flip into the mainstream. But then at the same time, you look at who got nominated for Emmy Awards on that show. And these women, these trans women are doing some of the most incredible performances um, I, that, that I've ever seen an actor do in these very three-dimensional characters. And the only person that gets nominated after year is Billy Porter, who's phenomenal, but is you know, a cis gay black man, which obviously is a huge step forward for that group as well. But the show is about black trans women, uh, women and we have not uh, nominated a single one of them for an award yet. So uh, there are there are things like that that are very complicated and very stressful. And there's a lot of intersectionality in the queer community, obviously, that um, that can lead to deeper, more nuanced conversations about those things. But uh, Obviously, we were, it, the fact that we're even having this conversation about shows that do exist like that is an amazing testament to just how far that we've come even since I've joined this industry. You know, that I never in a million years would have known that or thought that there would be roles that I could have auditioned for that weren't head kick. Um, and now there are so many and they're continuing to be written and continuing to be um, bumped up on the call sheet. So sooner or later, we're going to see shows that actually have um, you know, like a non-binary person playing the lead as opposed to the, you know, best friend of the friend. Um, and I'm really looking forward to what happens in the next couple of years because of that. And because of this, this whole moment has really given everybody a lot of opportunity to take stock with their own um, feelings about marginalized uh, communities and marginalized stories. And hopefully that'll just lead to um, for people reaching down to help bring up voices that have just sort of been systemically um, kept on the on the lower end of the of the theatrical rung. So I, I can't wait to continue to make more art, to continue to be on more shows, um, and do more uh, things as a writer and as a producer, and hope that um, we can continue to push that. 
a lot closer to a world where <laughs> where it's a lot easier just to sort of jump into it um, like it is for for uh, a lot of you know cis white men. Yeah, I agree with everything Mason said, especially that Angelica Ross and MJ Rodriguez on Pose should be nominated for an Emmy. I couldn't say it enough. Um, I would also love to see trans masculine performers all over television, stage and screen. Um, oftentimes trans feminine actors and stories are the ones that are told, um, especially, especially uh, like in the fetishization as Mason was saying earlier, of uh, men playing trans women. Uh, we don't have that many stories of the trans masculine experience. And I think right now we're in a place where uh, there are people at the top who are curating the stories of queer bodies that are being told. And until the people at the top look like the stories that they're trying to tell, I don't know if we'll be at a place where the stories are not curated to give a certain impression of what the trans experience looks like. And until we see trans people across the spectrum, not only those who are on pose, but like some trans folks who work in STEM, everyone across the board, be it maybe a little bit less glamorous, deserves to have their story told. And I think with that on screen will come the normalization of trans people in everyday lives. Everyone wants to say they don't know a trans person and I'm wondering if they do and they haven't slowed down enough to take stock of the identity of everyone around them. And I'm really glad that hopefully in the next five to 10 years, we'll find ways to continue these conversations and for them to start to take effect. Thank you, such beautiful comments and I'm learning so much and I know people are, let's look at uh, what's coming on, uh, on, on the internet, what people are saying. Uh, let's see here. Mark says, I live in Durham, North Carolina, and I've seen a growing acceptance of the LGBT community in my progressive town, but it seems that this act acceptance is happening around the nation. Is it? Is this just my hopeful thinking as an African-American person, or are you seeing more cultural acceptance? Let's ask both of you, Mason first and then Kevin. Uh, I, uh, I actually lived in Raleigh, North Carolina for quite some time, which is very close to Durham. Um, so I used to do theater out there. And growing up in high school, I had a terrible time. Um, it was not an accepting environment for me as of then. And we toured to Durham with Hedvig and the Angry Inch. Um, and I had a very different experience the second time around. It was uh, even in just, you know, a, a span of eight years. So much about the culture and the understanding around the multitudes that people carry um, and the diversity that is out there in the world. Uh, it, it Really, the landscape of that place had changed in a dramatic way that I felt much safer to be in and much more taken care of. So um, uh, there are, it's really amazing to know and to think of all the pockets of places that like a couple of years ago may not have been um, a place where I could have like walked down the street wearing whatever I want. But, um, you know, I, I know that as time goes on and as people are given more information, information is power. Um, and empathy is, is obviously a powerful tool as well. And I think that there are so many places like Durham that are kind of just progressing naturally because the world is changing. People have more access to the world than they did before. They have more access to information. Um, and it's it's hopefully allowing uh, us to sort of soften and empathize with the differences of others. Um, so yeah, I, I, I am hopeful too. And I, I I hope that is true of the rest of the, the nation, although I know it is, there are pockets of it <laughs> that it is not necessarily 100% accurate. <laughs> yeah, I'm hopeful as well. I will say, when I hear cultural acceptance, I think um, that yes, people nowadays um, give human kindness to more people than perhaps in the past or a broader idea of what a human is. Uh, human rights are more important, but um, does that cultural acceptance come with uh, voting for people who will keep the safety of marginalized people in mind? I've worked a lot of contracts where everyone will bake you cupcakes for opening night um, and uh, go ahead and support 
something that directly works against the human rights of, say, the LGBTQ uh, community. Um, so I think time will tell. Uh, but in terms of human kindness, which I find uh, is more important on the streets day to day, uh, it's growing. And uh, I'm here to meet it with a smile. Thank you. Uh, Vandana says, Darren, Chris reminded me of a very Porter musical, which reminds me of J.K. Rowling. It's so disappointing that mm. she, who created something so meaningful and generational, generation defining, turned out to be a hateful turf. First, can you explain turf and uh, the J.K. Rowling controversy? Uh, do you know it, Mason? Yeah, so uh, turf stands for trans exclusionary radical feminism. Uh, it, it is a, a, a word or an abbreviation, um, an acronym, sorry, used to describe people that are uh, that use their feminism in a way that is not only detrimental to the trans community, it is exclusionary uh, and, and very hateful. Um, and yes, Darren, absolutely. I, a very Potter musical is actually what I fell in love with. Like, and is the reason why I'm obsessed with Darren. Uh, we bonded over that really, really early on on tour. But, um, and I know that like he would be unbelievably disappointed. I think it's kind of spectacular to see so many uh, of the people that made JK her fortune, you know, in, in film and like Daniel Radcliffe and all these people kind of denounce her views because they are so fundamentally wrong. Essentially, she, for the last couple of years, has sort of been tweeting out, um, consistently talking about her stance on, on trans women in the workplace, on trans women in bathrooms. She thinks that uh, basically, that trans women are sort of uh, their inclusion in womanhood is eventually going to become detrimental to the rights of, of a woman. So it's a very fear-based thing. She doesn't actually see trans women as women. She fundamentally as their gender that they were, or their uh, sex that they were assigned at birth. Um, and, and so it's a very complex issue if you don't understand the nuances of of uh, the transgender experience. And if you don't respect the idea that a trans person is the person that they are, the person that they declare that they are is who they are. Um, because gender is a construct. We all, anyone who, you know, uh, has any sort of scientific uh, experience in, in, the, in the gender sphere understands that um, we, they're literally just down to chromosomes, like the, the idea that they're called sex chromosomes came out of this need to have a shorthand. They don't represent X and Y don't actually represent mm -hmm. female and male, uh, 4% of the, of the actual like DNA within those chromosomes has anything to do with gender uh, or with sex. Um, but we, as as a society, as of you know, uh, I, I can't remember how many years ago that 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 sort of became became normal in the medical field, have kind of normalized this idea of like, oh, you're either a man or you're a woman. Mm -hmm. um, but there's people that are X Y Y and X Y Y, you know, and X X Y, and and there are intersex people, and there are so many kinds of ways in which the human body takes shape and takes form. And so, gender is just another another thing on top of that. Another construct on top of that um, and, and a very complicated thing but she doesn't see it that way she sees it as there are male and there are female people and I accept the idea of transness I accept the idea that you uh, say that you're a woman but I don't feel comfortable with you in the bathroom because I don't believe that you're a woman at your core I just respect you from afar and, and I think that you having right takes away the one uh, mine that I have you know fought for my entire life um, Pushing down at a marginalized group of people that and it's really painful and and sad to watch someone with such a big platform that is built on ideas of acceptance and uh, and the underdog that's what her entire like series is about it is a queer you know it, it is it is such an allegory for uh people that are different and she is unfortunately sort of become the dolores umbridge or the voldemort of her own story and just doesn't necessarily see it yet well, um, and hopefully time will change that for her. Well, that is, that, 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 I mean, for anybody who wanted to catch up on the J.K. Rowling <laughs> situation, has just uh, caught up. Uh, thank you for sharing that. And I know, especially with admiring artists, you know, it's hard to 
uh, see the artist uh, disappoint in, in so many ways. Uh, my mom, by the way, is watching from Kerala in India. Hi, Amma, love you. Always great to- Hi. We, we, we did a shout out to Kevin's mom earlier. And, uh, and I know that uh, Mason was also with family. So we want to do a shout out to family. Rose, by the way, is an amazing mother herself. And, uh, and she does all this great work with us and all her other work and also takes care of her family. And that is amazing. Uh, we are almost out of, uh, out of time. Uh, I want to point out what Apollo uh, said. Uh, it's awesome to see Mason Park and Kevin Paley give voice to non-binary people. And they're both so beautiful in their charisma, great warmth in their smiles and personalities. Thank you. And I say especially to Kevin, not easy uh, when you're working on your on your teeth and your smile to come out, uh, come on to uh, video and and uh, be there. So uh, uh, extra kudos, and uh, we're we're really grateful. Uh, awesome quarantine creativity. Looking forward to more of your art. And Mark says I need to put you in touch with my friends. Uh, he's listed a whole bunch of people. Some friends are more constantly fighting against stereotypes through their art forms. Uh, by the way, you should also know that we have trolls on this. Uh, on, on Twitter and elsewhere who've come in and said all kinds of terrible things. I don't read them out because we, we don't have to give them a platform, but just even on a show like this, people do find their way and it's so sad that people do it. Stefan says, I'm a born and bred Greenwich villager who's always supported the LG, LGBTQ community since I was a child. And I'm so happy to see so much progress for all the community over the years. Kevin and Mason, you're both absolutely fabulous. Uh, and Apollo says, Exactly. Punching down is in the, in the most marginalized people. Trans people have been missing for nearly 2,000 years, unlike South Asia, where they've maintained a presence. And we will do an episode with South Asians who are trans and can talk to us about the experience there and globally as well. Rahajan says, my own evolution has been spurred by A, my own outsider status in a dominant culture, cishet white, where I do not belong, and working, playing, and living outside various people. That's a process that's re that can't really be accelerated, in my opinion, mm -hmm. by corporate diversity initiatives. Still working on that evolution. Thank you, Rajan, for sharing that. And you heard Mason use the word intersectionality. And one of the things we do, Mason, is that we asked our friend Kimberly Crenshaw, the great Columbia Law School professor who coined the term intersectionality, how can we support black people? And she said, say their name. So Rajan went in and uh, made a list of the names of the folks who have been killed in police action. And we read that at the end of the show. So nice to see that all tied together. Mark says, great discussion. And you two remind me of the new generation of young leaders who are so much more open. And yes, we all have cohort workers who fit the LGBT community. With that, let's give both Mason and Kevin a big thank you and give them each a chance to say goodbye and some final thoughts for now. Hope you'll promise to come back in the months ahead. Yeah. Thank All you right. so much for having us. It's, okay, it's Kevin. It's been you... an absolute joy. Sorry, no, go ahead. You. Sorry, sorry. Oh, no, no, Kevin, go. Okay. <laughs> oh, no, it's fine. Thank you, Sri, and thank you, Rose, and everyone at home. It's really been a pleasure. I'll do this anytime. <laughs> and I love <laughs> this uh, handle you have. Holla if you hear me. I like that. Oh, yeah, that's for Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Oh, uh, let's thank go. You. No, oh God, that handle really made me laugh when we first met. Um, <laughs> I, I thank you so much for having us. I mean, it is it is a really great time for everybody to sort of start connecting with people that they wouldn't have otherwise met in real life. So I'm so excited to like take opportunities like this to um, to sort of reach new new folks and and talk to new people. So I appreciate you for what you've been doing during quarantine and it's amazing how much you've accomplished like it's it's so exciting to think of all the people you've talked to so thanks for having and, us and rose has been there every step of the way jonathan says a great show a non-binary or a binary decision thank you and rajan says thank you kevin and mason blessings to you and your respective family and loved ones we'll let you both go thank you so much uh for being thank here you. and goodbye thank you and thank you Rose, you did another fabulous job. They were fantastic. They were amazing. Thank you for bringing them uh, on here. And uh, I can't wait till you go out to more shows. That means you'll have more guests to bring us as well. The importance of going to the, staying for the uh, talk back and then going and saying hello after. So thank you very much, Rose. I really appreciate it.
Thank you. Thank All you. Right. Really terrific show. Thank you. And I know how hard it is for you to be off Twitter while the show is on. So we'll let you get back to Twitter. And everyone, follow Rose and tweet at her and follow her tweets. She's amazing. Uh, she does so much work for all of us to put this show together. Also, big shout out to Vandana Menon. Uh, her observations about J.K. Rowling got us, I think, a fantastic set of sound bites from Mason. Thanks very much, Rose. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, that's Rose and Kevin and Mason. Thank you so much for being here. Let's read some of the other comments that are uh, coming in. Uh, so good to see all of these comments. And uh, Ashok, who's watching from Trivandrum, says, would like to inform you that both of us, me and my daughter Minakshi, were tested positive on August 19th. After 10 days, we were tested negative. We were in the Kerala State First Line Treatment Center for 10 days. We have come back home. I'm so glad to hear you're OK. Ashok has been a regular viewer and supporter of this show, watching from my parents' hometown in Kerala in India. Thank you so much for being here. Glad you're OK. And uh, 10 days, I know they must have been really hurtful and painful, but glad you're back. We hear so many stories of people who have taken so long to get mm -hmm. better and to get back. I uh, want to alert everybody to uh, the show that I co-produce. Uh, that will run tomorrow with Dr. Sujana Chandrasekhar and Dr. Marina Kurian. Mm -hmm. She's on call on Facebook, on Twitter, on Sunday at 11 a.m. Eastern. And uh, they will have two very uh, important and timely guests, Dr. Marsha Harris, who specializes in colon and rectal surgery. You know that uh, the great Chadwick Boseman died of colon cancer. So we'll talk to Marsha about that. And then we'll talk to Dr. Monica Gutierrez, who's in rehab medicine. She was on my radio show earlier, and she talked about how uh, men and women in all age groups, 20s to 70s, are in her rehab in San Antonio, Texas, learning to walk again, learning to talk again, learning to eat again. And so anyone tells you that this is a hoax, this is not real, as someone called into my radio show today on WBAI and said that they are so wrong. And you will hear about that tomorrow. These days, our weekends are busy around here. We have five shows. Uh, so we have this show tonight. We have the radio show on Saturday morning. On Sunday morning at 8.30, we do the New York Times read along where we read the New York Times out loud like crazy people, 8.30 to 10.15 a.m. every Sunday. Liza Donnelly, New Yorker cartoonist, will be with us. And uh, she is fantastic, making her third appearance on the New York Times read along in the last five years. And so uh, honored to count her as a friend and someone who I learned so much from. We work together in New York, in Pittsburgh and in Dubai. And we'll talk all about that on all our social channels. And then we'll have She's On Call. And then at night at 9 p.m. Eastern, Ruth Ratlot will be here for our positivity episode. Every Sunday, we talk to per generally positive people, positive, purposeful people, and Ruth will be our guest. So please join us at 9 p.m. Eastern for that. We have a very important show on Tuesday where the head of the World Health Organization's uh, expert, of uh, the top expert on mass gatherings and on social events and sports events will be with us at 11 a.m. Eastern on Tuesday. You don't want to miss that episode. So now we're going to do what we promised Kimberly Crenshaw we would do we are going to say their names as uh, listed out by Rahajan, who worked very hard to put this list together. I am so grateful to him for doing that. So I'm going to now uh, call up the list and read the names. And please join me as we read these names. Jacob Blake is on the list, who is uh, with us still, paralyzed, but with us, shot by police on August 23rd, 2020, exactly a week ago. Where were you when you first heard the story? Where were you when you first saw that video? And so now let us read their names of the, of the victims of police violence. George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, Michael Dean, Tatiana Jefferson, Botham Jean, Antoine Rose II, Danny Ray Thomas, Stefan Clark, Aaron Bailey, Char Charlena Shavon Lyles, Jordan Edwards, Chad Robertson, Muhammad Muhaim Jr., Terence Crutcher, Corin Gaines, Joseph Mann, Philando Castile. I just want to say 
that some of these names like Philando and others are names you know because they become sadly household names, but just as sadly, so many of these names you've never heard before or know nothing about. Each one has a backstory. Alton Sterling, Kaylin Rockmore, Janet Wilson, India Kager, Samuel DuBose, Darius Stewart, Sandra Bland, Alexia Christian, William Chapman II, Freddie Gray Jr., Walter Scott, Eric Harris, Maya Hall, Megan Hockaday, Janisha Fonville, Natasha McKenna, Jerame Reed, Tamir Rice, Akai Gurley, Tanisha Anderson, Aura Rosser, Shanique Proctor, Laquan McDonald, Michelle Cousseau, Michael Brown Jr., Eric Garner, Pearlie Golden, Gabriela Navarez, Yvette Smith, Renisha McBride, Miriam Carey, Kaim Livingston, Kayla Moore, Shelley Fry, Melissa Williams, Shulena Weldon, Alicia Thomas, Chantel Davis, Charmel Edwards, Rekia Boyd, Sharice Francis, Trayvon Martin, Eliana Stanley Jones, Ryan Boudou, whose brother was here on this show a few months ago telling us about how his brother died in police custody. Tanika Wilson, Katherine Johnston, Albert Spruill, Kendra James, Latanya Haggerty, Margaret Laverne Mitchell, Taisha Miller, Danette Daniels, Frankie Ann Perkins, Sanji Taylor, Eleanor Bumpers, and that takes us to 1984. Emmett Till, killed by white supremacists August 28th, 1955. That's right, the anniversary was yesterday. George Stinney Jr., convicted of murder in an unfair trial as determined in 2014 and executed in an electric chair on June 16, 1944. And that's not all the names. That's not even the start of all the names, but we must read them and we will continue to update them. Rahajan is working on an, an unupdated list. Sadly, there are other names and other instances that have even happened since uh, all of this, uh, the national attention has been, uh, and the spotlight has been put on police and what they what they do. Let's look at some of the other comments that have come in. Uh, uh, Ashok and Minakshi, I'm very glad that you're negative for COVID-19. Continued blessings to you. Rajan says, one of the more saddening, angering things about George Steeney's execution in 1944 was that he was the youngest person ever ex executed in an electric chair. He was only 14. Just think about that. And just horrifying, horrifying. And with that, we come to another end of another episode. We are so grateful to all of you for watching. Thank you for being here. Thank you for supporting us in so many ways. One way is by watching. Another way is by telling a friend about this. A third is uh, by telling your friends who are looking to promote something that they should sponsor us. And we would love to talk to them. You have my email address about sponsorship. We're always open to ideas and collaboration. If there are ways in which we can extend the reach of this program, we would love to do this. Apollo says, awesome show. Uh, so let us now thank our sponsors once again for being so great and supporting us, including unbelievable, divinely delicious cookies on a mission, 20% off with the code SRE, S-R-E-E. -E. Please take a look and please support nunbelievable.com. Big thank you to Muckrack Academy, Fundamentals of Social Media, free course available right now, mrac.co slash social, mrac.co slash social. We are also grateful to Charles Cunnan Carroll and The Inventor in You, a step-by-step -step guide to your first invention. At Inventor Charles is his Twitter handle and guide to invention.com. Charles is the developer of more than 80 patents. Thank you so much, Charles, for your sponsorship. And as always, we're grateful for the uh, for additional support provided by The new Indian film Sadak 2 has just premiered and is now streaming straight to your screen only on Hotstar with subtitles. Check out hotstar.com slash US, Hotstar USA on Twitter. And we also want to say thank you to our friends at Rise or Fall Together, the one shared world. 
Interdependence Summit, Thursday, September 17th. Dozen plus awesome speakers, three hours of programming, all free. Renee Fleming, who's the world acclaimed singer, uh, David Nabarro, the WHO Special Envoy for COVID-19 Preparedness, Jairam Ramesh, Chairman of the Parliamentary Committee on Environment in Climate Change for India, and Kekashan Basu, Founder and President uh, and of the Green Hope Foundation and UN Human Rights Champion. All of this is coming to you if you register now at oneshared.world, oneshared.world. Thanks very much, everybody. We're so grateful to all of you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for supporting us. You can join us and you can support us also by following me on Twitter at Sri, uh, tweeting at me at Sri, uh, connecting with me on email and subscribing and checking out our archives. More than 170 episodes, all available on youtube.com slash Srinet, youtube.com slash Srinet. Please join us there and please hit that subscribe button. And also, if you are able to hold up your camera phone right now, you can get an alert via a very gentle WhatsApp alert, not a WhatsApp group, a WhatsApp alert. Please join us by uh, just signing up for that. And if you can't do that, just ask me to add you. Thanks very much, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. We're here back at 9 p.m. Eastern time for this show, 8.30 a.m. Eastern time for the New York Times read along where we read the print edition of the New York Times.